these are two pictures from a demonstration that actually happened outside of the U.S. Con uh, the consulate um, last year. And I wanted to show them because they give a good perspective of what the general sentiment in Mexico is towards um, immigration. The one at the bottom says, um, Vive la raza que mantiene a su país abajo las fronteras. Um, for those of you who don't speak Spanish, that means long live the race that maintains your country down with the borders. Um, and really, that's, um, that's in a nutshell, um, the sentiment towards immigration is that immigration is humane. It's the right thing to do for the Mexican economy. It's the right thing to do for families. Um, there isn't really a lot of debate about whether it's right or wrong. It's more that that's the general sentiment. The one at the top says, ningún ser humano es ilegal. In other words, no human being is illegal. And this was something that I found at first a little bit hard, is that um, in, in Mexico there's really not, most people don't perceive being in the United States without documents as illegal. It's something that, it's a necessity. It's what they need to do sometimes, um, but, they, but people there find it very offensive if you say that they're illegal in the U.S. Um, in the course of my work, I'll do interviews with um, mothers, for example, that are coming up to visit their children in Mexico. And if you ask them, um, are any of your children illegally in the U.S., they'll say, no, my children are working. They are law-abiding citizens. They don't break the traffic laws. But then, so I had to learn that I had to do the question very different. I have to ask, um, do, are any of your children in the U.S. with their papers in, in tramite, so in the process of being fixed? And then that's where they would say yes, and they would tell you how they, how they crossed, crossed over. So I wanted to kind of point this out, that the, the debate in Mexico is very different from the debate that, that you see here in, in the United States. Um, if you're in Mexico, one of the quickest ways to get in a fight or make some enemies is to be supportive of the fence, the border fence. Um, the border fence is perceived in the Mexican press, um, numerous articles about it being um, compared to the Berlin Wall or South African apartheid. Um, it's, it's looked as, as a fence that really is intended to, to be divisive. Um, and more so, Mexicans see the border more as a zone rather than an actual line. Um, you'll, in May, there was a good article in the National Geographic magazine that they talked about, um, where they interviewed a lot of Mexicans and Americans on the, on the border area, and they would talk about them going to the border and crossing over to eat lunch, or then going shopping in the afternoon, coming back, or there was even a case where they would um, the high schools would get together at the border and play a volleyball game and then each go back. And so um, the, the United States approved the border fence for many Mexicans is, is kind of offensive and even high level government officials have come out against, have come out against the fence. Um, one of the things, there's a lot of research done on assimilation, um, in other words how Mexicans that come to the United States um, um, assimilate into the culture. Um, I can speak firsthand for this. My mother is uh, from Chile, so I'm second generation immigrant from, from Chile. I have strong roots in Latin America also. Um, but um, one of the things that has really evolved over time is the way that the Mexican government deals with immigration. Um, if over 30 years ago, and my parents lived in Mexico when I was just a little kid, actually my first language was Spanish when I was just growing up, but when, when we were there, immigration was really seen as, as a cop-out, or Mexicans that would go to the United States were kind of seen as traitors, people that would leave their country, um, left their country behind. Um, even there was a program in the 1960s, it was called the Bracero Program. It was a, similar to the guest worker program that's now in place where people could go up to the U.S., work for several months, and then go back down to Mexico. The Mexican government actually played a large role in, in canceling that program and in, in not, not continuing the program. They wanted to keep Mexicans um, from, from leaving the country. Uh, more recently, kind of fast forwarding to where we are today, the Mexican government has a very different approach. Um, president Vicente Fox, who was the president 
up until recently, he was quoted numerous times as calling immigrants as heroes, people that would make a huge sacrifice to help their families be away from their families while they were um, trying to make a living. And part of the reason for this is that there is a large, um, a large portion of Mexican economy comes from remittances. Um, remittances are the, is that money that's sent back to Mexico from um, migrants that are working here in the United States. It's actually become the second largest source of revenue in Mexico um, for the Mexican government, only second to oil revenues. Oil revenues are about $26 billion a year. Remittances are about $21 billion is what they were in 2006. So it's a large portion. Um, per capita, it's I think I saw there was a study that was done out of California that said that it was about $1,300 a month are sent back by, um, by work, Mexican workers in California back to Mexico to their, to their family. Yes, there's a question right back here. Do you want to put the microphone? Oh, sorry. Is there a microphone in the room? Okay, go ahead. I just wondered how much of that money was actually taxed here. Do they know before it goes to Mexico? How much of it's taxed by the U.S. government before right. before it leaves? Yes. That I don't know, to tell you the truth. I haven't seen studies that have shown how much. Um, a, a lot of it depends on whether they are registered with Social Security, which surprisingly a lot of them are. Um, there's a lot of Mexicans that come to work in the United States that even though they're not legally living here, they do contribute to Social Security. Because we, on the other end, we get um, a lot of the beneficiaries years later, e either after they've passed, uh, passed away or once they've retired, that they can collect Social Security benefits even if they, um, even if they weren't working here legally. But I don't have any hard, hard facts on that. Um, Two of these pictures down here are just of events. Um, part of what the Mexican government really tries to do to keep connected with the Mexican community in the United States. Um, fair, they conduct several fairs and events, and this is part of my job. I work with the Mexican government officials who are coordinating these events, helping the groups. There were their groups of mariachis or um, the artisans come to these events. Um, this one on the on the left here, you'd probably be surprised, but it's actually in Los Angeles, down, downtown Los Angeles. Um, and the one on the right is one of their cultural houses. They call them um, Centros Culturales, but in Guadalajara, there's, I think they have about 30. The state of Jalisco that we're in has about 30 of these cultural houses throughout the country. And basically, it's that they want to keep the ties with Mexicans overseas. Um, part of it is because it's a big heritage, but also part of it is because of the remittances. Um, there are studies that, that have been done that shown that um, that remittances gradually decrease as people, as Mexicans living in the U.S. start to buy homes, buy cars, have kids, as probably is expected, the amount of remittances that they send back to Mexico dec decreases. And so part of what the Mexican government does is to keep these ties strong with, with um, Mexicans living overseas. There's also several programs that the Mexican government has in place to increase and channel where remittances are coming, um, the remittances that are coming into Mexico. There's a program, it's called Tres por Uno, um, three for one, it's the translation. But what it is, is that for every dollar that migrants send back to Mexico designated for a specific government projects, such as paving a road or for a school, the federal government, state government, and municipal government match a dollar for that contribution. Um, it's had mixed results. There's um, someone in, in Jalisco right now with USAID that's studying the remittance, um, this Tres por Uno program. Um, part of what they've told me is that they have a lot of problems because um, a lot of times what the migrants in Mexico that want the money to come back, what they want to designate the money for is very different from what the Mexican government, the, the municipal governments want to use that money for. Whereas somebody 
in the U.S. sending back money might want it for maybe a, a dance hall or a cultural event, um, whereas the Mexican government wants them rather for, for roads and schools. And so there's a little bit of um, s some work that they're doing. They're actually considering expanding that program more into the private sector where people could send back money and have those go towards businesses. The second program here is called the Paisano program. Paisano just means it's countrymen. I don't know if there's a better translation for that. But what it is, is back in the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of problems with um, Mexicans going back to Mexico that crossing the border, there would be police that would shake them down and they'd be, um, be subject to bribery, corruption. And so they basically just stopped going back down to Mexico. And so if, in order for the federal government to protect and encourage people to come back down to Mexico, they started this program called the Paisano Program <clears throat> where people can, re can report these kind of abuses and they also um, have a lot of federal funds that are allocated towards protecting, having police, federal police that protect um, migrants that are coming back to Mexico. There's a small percentage in Mexico of, of people and that debate that actually remittances are bad for the country. Um, one of them being the governor of the Mexican Central Bank, Governor Ortiz. But in, in several of the, the newspaper articles, he's come out strongly against remittances and encouraging people to send back money. In one of the studies that the Central Bank that he leads, um, one of the studies that they presented showed that the states that receive higher percentage of remittances actually have lower development and lower GDP per capita. Um, that there's actually a negative correlation between remittances and development in a country. Um, some of the states, if you look here, this is, this is the state of Michoacán. It's, it has 11% of its um, gross domestic product that comes from remittances. Um, they're actually one of the least developed states in the country. Um, some of the other ones, Aguas Calientes, it's, it's the one right next to it. This is, also, this is where we live in Jalisco. This is Aguas Calientes. Um, Aguas Calientes has the next highest, 8% of its GDP comes from remittances, and it also is one of the lesser, lesser developed states. Um, what they argue is that the remittances don't go necessarily towards creating employment, investment in companies, but rather they go for, towards more of a private welfare system where families receiving this money um, let's say $1,000 a month from a brother or from a, their father working in the United States doesn't have as much incentive to go out and get a job or start a business because they have their basic needs taken care of by, by the migrant that's in the United States. Um, and in fact, there are some, there's some towns that I've been to in Michoacan where you'll go and probably 70% of the people in that village will be females um, because a lot of the men have, have left to go work in the U.S. And it's almost a rite of passage. It's almost um, expected of them. You know, their father went up and worked in the U.S. for several years. Their, their grandfather there, their father did. And now when they turn 16, 17, it's their turn to make the trek up north to, um, to also bring money back for the family. Yes, did you have a question? That's a good question. There's a lot of them that, that stay. Yeah, let me restate the question. The question was, um, what, what do they come back to when they return to Mexico? And I don't think, I haven't seen any studies in, per se that are able to pinpoint them. Um, of course, some of them never return. I, I think we can expect that. Those that return, um, a lot of them do come back um, with a lot of money. There's actually several Mexican state senators, like at the federal level, that have crossed over when they were teenagers. They made their fortune. They came back, and um, with that money that they earned in the U.S., they established um, their businesses. There's one in particular he's called, they call him the Rey de los Tomates, the tomato king. But he came up to the U.S., and he made uh, a, a very good living. He established a chain of restaurants. Um, and then years later, he came back to Mexico, run for, ran for mayor, 
was elected mayor, ran for state office, and then now he's a federal, he's like when it, comparable to our, our federal senators. Um, there's a lot of success stories like that that the Mexican press often refers to, and it creates, uh, it goes back to creating that um, perception that, you know, the way to get ahead in life is making that trek up, up north and where, where incomes are so much higher. Yes? They they do, and that was part. Yeah, you want to repeat the question? Sorry. I'm just wondering about the studies by the central bank, and if they recognize the issue of of the difficulty of assessing how the money comes back in that we would expect it to come to the poorest places mm -hmm. and be not be spent on development, just because those are the poorest places that have the greatest incentive for northward migration and the lowest incentive, since there are no workers there, for capital investment? Yeah, um, that's, that's a good question because it, I've, I've seen several analysis of this study. Some make, you know, some argue that it's kind of the chicken or the egg. You know, what came first? Did, is it because they're so underdeveloped that people have to leave and that's why there's the most re remittances? Or is it because the remittances are coming in that it keeps it, keep those places impoverished? Um, I don't, I don't know what the, the answer to that, if, if there is, um, but there's several, several high-level people in the Mexican government that do realize that it's a disincentive um, a lot of times for, for families in Mexico to be receiving those remittances. Um, now on to the economic issue. I studied economics, so I view just about every problem through the eyes of economics, but there, this was one of the, before I, before I, when I was putting together this presentation, I passed this presentation by several of my Mexican coworkers and just made sure that they, that I wasn't misrepresenting them or saying every, anything that they might not, might not agree with. One of the things that I asked them is, um, if given the opportunity, would Mexicans rather stay in Mexico? Or, or do, would they rather come up to the U.S.? And they agreed that most Mexicans would probably rather live in Mexico. Um, that's where their families are. That's where they grew up. That's where they have their roots. Um, be, but because of the lack of economic opportunities, lack of employment, low wages, it, it forces them to, to migrate to the United States. Um, let me just show you a couple of facts that kind of highlight this. If you look here at the top left graph, it shows the daily minimum wage. Um, I base this on 575. Is that still the minimum wage? Um, that makes it a daily minimum wage of $46 a day if you're working a job minimum wage job in the U.S., whereas in Mexico, the minimum wage is $4.50 a day. Um, the guards that we have at the consulate, they get paid about a dollar an hour um, above minimum wage, but you know, they put their lives on the line for, for very little money. Um, if you look at an average construction job in Mexico, um, where we, again, these are a lot of the people that I come in contact with, they're making about $120 a week, working six days a week, um, working very long hours, very hard jobs. Um, if you compare that to an uh, average construction job in the U.S. Um, that makes $12, $13 an hour, it'd be closer to 480 um, dollars a week. Some other numbers that back that up, the percentage of po uh, the population be below the poverty level, this is from the CIA world um, facts, um, facts from the CIA, 40% um, of the Mexican population is living below poverty, whereas in the U.S. it's closer to 12%. And if you look at the unemployment rate, 25% uh, there's an unemployment rate of 25% in Mexico, whereas in the U.S., you know, of course it varies by region, but it's about 5%. Um, so again, these are some of the some of the economic factors that lead to to the migration. Um, that kind of leads me into my role at the consulate. Um, part of my role at the consulate is to interview Mexicans that are coming up to the United States 
and see if they are intending immigrants. The visas that we're, there's different classification of visas. Some visas are immigrant visas, people that state up front that they are coming to live in the United States and they either petition through a family member and it's a very long process. The other types of visas are student visas, work visas. The one I do primarily is tourist visas, visas for people that are coming to live, to not live, to visit and visit the U.S. for a short period of time. However, part of the interview is to determine whether they are economic migrants or they have an intention to, to stay in the U.S., which it makes it a very hard job. Um, and, and every, um, in any given day, I interview anywhere between 120 to 150 Mexicans in Spanish to determine whether they are intending immigrants. Um, it's not a perfect science. It's, um, there's a lot of room for error, but um, these are some of the facts that kind of point to the, the kind of the trend and what we're looking for. Um, there's, there's, there's a whole, whole series of things that we try to look for in applicants to determine whether they are economic migrants and they intend to stay in the U.S. or, you know, they really are just going up to visit family, um, go do some shopping and, and come, back, come back to Mexico. Um, given this, these, these numbers, you can see that there's, um, there's a lot of desperation in Mexico. A lot of times there, people get very creative in their stories that they tell us um, to try to get across. Mexico is a very high fraud post. Um, I can go into that a little bit more but later, but documents are very easy to get, um, very cheaply bought, and so a lot of times we'll have people in front of us who claim to be in a certain job, but digging in a little bit, we find out that they're not. Um, just one quick example, I had a money exchanger um, come up to my window. He said he was going up to the U.S. to, to um, visit some relatives. And I said, oh, really? So, you know, tell me about your business. So he told me a little bit about it. And I said, so what, what does the dollar, what's the exchange rate for the dollar? And he says, um, it's about, a, about 12 to 1, which I knew wasn't right because I change money very, very frequently. And then I asked him, well, how do you, you know, what, what do you sell the dollar for and what do you buy it for? Anyway, he said uh, 12 dollars or 12 pesos for the dollar. And that's what he bought it for and sold it for. So immediately I could see that it wasn't, wasn't the case. Um, we have a lot of similar type of um, stories where we've had nuns that will disguise children as, um, as a nun and try to reconnect them with their families in the U.S. Um, there's, there's just a lot of different cases where um, because of these economic circumstances, people go to very large lengths to, to, um, to create a different persona than who, who, who they might be. Um, probably the, the other part of my job is um, with, with security. So we have the economic, we have the economic migrants um, and we also have a lot of security issues that we, that we deal with. Um, one, the State Department's motto is, is secure borders and open doors and that's really what we try to go by is we want to be a welcoming society one where we encourage students to come to the United States to study exchanges to happen um, but also we we need to ensure that our country's safe um, these these here are visas that were issued to the 9-11 hijackers um, the one on top is Muhammad, Muhammad, Muhammad Atta he was one of the organizers of the September 11th attack. Um, this was his visa. The one on the bottom is one of his accomplices. Um, this was part of the, the wreckage that was found um, on one of the flights. Um, because of those September 11th attacks, um, there was a substantial amount of resources and time um, that went into securing our borders. Um, it's very different now than it was in 2000, the beginning of 2001. Um, in our job, there's facial recognition. It's a program that is able to identify um, people that look similar to you. Um, so, for example, let me give you one example. Last week, actually, we had an applicant that, that came in with a Mexican passport, tried to pass himself off as a, as a Mexican, but the, my coworker who was interviewing him recognized that he had a, a little bit of an accent. He didn't speak Spanish just perfectly. And so dug into it a little bit, and, and, and he looked at the facial recognition, and it, 
and results. And this person had applied for a, a, a visa in Palestine, in Israel, actually, as, as a Palestinian a couple months ago. Um, it was hard. We're, they're still working on, on, on the case, but it's something to, to show that the technology has really helped to keep people out. I don't know what his intent were, was or is, um, but programs like, like this are able to keep people out of the country that might do us harm. Um, in Mexico, we most of all we have um, a lot of drug, a lot of drug trade. Um, this was also in a case from last week. I had a, I had a mother come to the consulate with her three children. And she said that she was going to Disneyland with her three children. And I wasn't worried about her being an economic migrant because her profile was of somebody that was very wealthy. Um, but I, told, I, I asked her, you know, how are you going to do it to go to Disneyland? I have three children, and I wouldn't dare take them to Disneyland by myself. How are you going to do that with the hotel, waiting in lines? And something just didn't seem right in, in, in probing about her husband, she said that her husband just didn't, wasn't interested in going, didn't want to go, didn't have an interest on going on the family vacation. So I did a little research on the, the father and come to find out he was a big time narco trafficker in Mexico. Um, he had been arrested numerous times for money laundering, possession of weapons, um, selling narcotics in the United States. Um, and so Unfortunately, I had to tell her that she couldn't go to Disneyland with her children. Um, but a lot of the technology and, and resources that the government has spent have, um, in my opinion, been very well spent in keeping um, people that intend to do our country harm out of, out of the United States. Um, another aspect of um, a foreign service officer is public affairs. Um, there are public um, and apart from the consular cone, which is what I'm the the role that I'm currently doing, there's also the the public diplomacy cone that's responsible for for more of the outreach programs, the student exchanges, relationships with the press, um, organizing, coordinating events. Um, you'd be surprised that in in other countries, even Mexico, being such a close neighbor to us, there's a lot of misperceptions about Americans. Um, one of them that's frequently reported in the press is that the United States government sends Mexican citizens to the front lines in the war in Iraq um, so that they're the first casualties in war. Um, it's something that, you know, it takes consistently for us to be out there being able to explain that that's not how it works, that it's a voluntary army, how that there really isn't a front war, a front line in the war in Iraq. Um, and there's a lot of explanation that needs to go into that to help people understand or correct a lot of these misperceptions um, about, the, about the U.S. Um, there's also a lot of events that um, are coordinated in order to help exchanges. Um, we had a group of uh, mayors recently from the state of Jalisco that came up to the U.S. and they met with, their, with mayors of towns that were about their same size, met with the police chiefs, with different organizations within the government and really to get that exchange of ideas going um, for really both both sides to be able to understand each other better and that's what the public diplomacy cone works works a lot in um, the, the other section there is student exchanges they work with Fulbright scholarship programs they help get professors down to Mexico to speak on topics um, last week I attended a, um, a seminar in Mexico that was on good governance and part of the public diplomacy department, what they did is to help sponsor one of a university professor from Philadelphia, an expert on the topic, to go down there and speak at this conference. Um, the other three cones that we've taught, the other cones within the Foreign Service are the political, economic, and then the ones we talked about, consular management and public diplomacy. This graph, I basically wanted to, to show that with in each of the cones, there's a wide variety of, of jobs. Um, there are, for example, in the political political officers, they're all, they're responsible for reporting on what's happening in the country. They also work on um, labor unions, human rights issues. Um, they we have representatives at the UN, NATO, a lot of different org different organizations. 
Um, economic officers, that's actually what I came into the State Department as. Um, economic officers, they work on um, IPR issues, intellectual property rights. Um, 